Very, very happy to have a really strong second session. Uh, two fantastic property investors, but also people I very, very much consider as friends. Um, we're going to have a fantastic time, not only from the information they give to you, but also the uh, exercises that are going to be on the table afterwards. Please give a huge round of applause to Rob McFun and Simon Zucci. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, we've been asked to run a little session uh, about um, opening up conversations. With certain. Now, look, we've got some pretty experienced people looking around the room. And it's great to see everyone here for this event. Um, but you know what? We, we believe that sometimes people get into bad habits, and they sometimes forget things they should say, and, and maybe dive straight into the deal and forget to build the all-important rapport. So the idea is we're going to have a little bit of a chat and then give you some content slides and then we're going to get you doing some work, which is always a good thing. Uh, on your table, it's going to get you to do some exercises and we're going to share the feedback. And we think this will be a really useful uh, refresher for some people because when you call someone up, you never know what that opportunity could turn into. And instead of having any assumptions about asking great questions and getting to really open up, find out what's the problem, why have they responded to that landlord letter. We've said there's a reason why they've done that. Now, sometimes they're just curious. They want to know what's going on. Sometimes they're wildly over-optimistic about what their property's worth. We know that. But also, sometimes there's a great opportunity there. And we can only find that by asking great questions. So first of all, Rob, would you like to introduce yourself to people who don't know and say a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, this is a first, isn't it? I don't think we've really worked like this before. I don't so, think we have. No, I think looking at the faces, I think we ought to be called the, the two bonnies. Because uh, I think, you know, looking at our faces. With yeah, yeah, bonnets. let's forget and, the and gags, Rob. Let's just, oh, yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Like, it looks like it's going to be yeah. dumb and dumb. He's here all dumb night, dumb obviously. Yeah, yeah. But, still. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, no, seriously, Rob. Uh, My, we, we, yeah. We've got only four hours to share with these yeah. people. It's not a lot for you, is it? So uh, we, we should probably crack on, really. So, yeah. so Rob, um, you, you in, do you want to tell me about your background in terms of what specifically you were doing? Because obviously you had a lot to do with communication and, and yeah. helping people to communicate. Yeah. So you've got a lot of uh, background experience. And obviously you're one of our... Property Mastermind coaches as well. Do you want to give people a bit right. of a background? Um, basically, I came to property late. As you know, it was a, a real life change for me in that basically I was a police officer. I joined uh, Humberside Police at 16 years of age. So I'm from the north, uh, Ranjan, so, uh, but proper north, like. Um, and <laughs> basically, I was uh, started at 16. Um, and I was talking to uh, Roberta last night, the photographer, about one of the first instances I ever dealt with was I was only 16 years of age with uh, no truncheon, no radio, nothing, and came across two blokes fighting on Freeman Street in Grimsby. And learnt then that if I wanted to keep my good looks, you know, I had to become a, a bit of a talker, because I'm certainly not a fighter. So, especially when I was only 10 and a half stone at 16 years of age. So, basically I did 34 years in the police. I did 20 years on, on the streets, um, dealing with all the things that that entails, all the, all the incidents that you go to, and incredibly volatile and very tense incidents, sometimes hostage taking, sometimes a lot of, <clears throat> involving a lot of negotiation, and where people basically didn't want to talk to you. You know, yeah. So it, it was very, very quickly about going into a situation, weighing the situation up, but also weighing the people up. Um, and, 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 and you're familiar with the phrase that we have about the ABC of policing, which is, yeah. you know, assume nothing, believe absolutely nobody, and check everything, you know? So that's, that was my background for thir 34 years. And by believe nobody, I don't mean that everybody lies to you. I just mean that basically people tell you their perception mm. of the, the situation and that, you know, we all say... that's that. very true in property as well, isn't it? Massively, a yeah. Anyone who's dealt with motivated sellers before... Sometimes they will hold back information. Sometimes that's deliberately. Sometimes they think it's not important and it is important. And sometimes people actually do tell you incorrect things because they think they can tell you loads of stuff that's not actually true, like you won't actually work it out when you come to buy the property. But it kind of wastes a lot of time, doesn't it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. They look at it from their point of view, and we'll, we'll come on to that with a couple of slides. But basically... <laughs> It's their version of the truth. It's what they want to tell you. It's what they think is important rather than what you know is important. Mm. And, and I always say this to a lot of my coachees, you're the one bringing the knowledge. They've not got the knowledge. They're telling <clears> you it from their point of view without the knowledge that you've got to turn that into a deal. So one of the differences as well with me and the police force though is after 20 years, I went into training. 
So I started to train other officers, particularly in respect of diversity, in respect of attitude, handling your emotions, handling your attitude and things like that. But also I did interview training. So for three, four years, I trained officers in how to, in interview techniques. And obviously, again, just similar to property, you're interviewing witnesses, you're interviewing uh, victims, but you're also interviewing suspects. And as soon as you go into that interview room, they're the last people who want to actually talk to you. So one of the first things we needed to train was how to make a, make a connection with that person, how to build rapport, so that you at least got them talking about things that are non-controversial and then move into what you wanted to talk to, talk about. And I think that's where I've learned a lot about it's about them, it's not about you. Yeah. you know? Even though I'm a hell of a talker and people think that mm. you know, I talk for and England. We, but and that's an important point about you, you've got to put yourself in their shoes because we all come with assumptions and beliefs based on our experience, yeah. but that doesn't mean that's going to be the same for them. And you said perception's really important, isn't it? Perceptions, checking out language, checking out words. What does that mean? You know, it's got a you know, something as simple as it's got a large garden. You know, mm. well, what's large mean? You yeah. know, it's got vast amount. You know, my large garden was like 100 meters long. I ended up selling it as a plot of land, etc. But so in my mind, and but prior to that, I had a house with an acre. Yeah. That was a large garden, you know, sort yeah. of thing. So it, it's, it's understanding that you need to pick up on the nuances, understand what they're saying. And, and I, I'm going to, you know, refer to Andy um, earlier on. I've got a slide, actually, that refers to Andy. I didn't put it in deliberately, but it's a great example. But, but Andy was saying that basically he came at it from his point of view on a particular deal mm. rather than <clears throat> understanding the other person's sort of issues. So. Yeah. Great, and actually you've also written a book, which we'll be giving a few people a yeah, absolutely. competition later, yeah. someone will get a copy of that. Yeah, yeah. And also we've got some of uh, Chris Voss's book as well. Yeah. Who's read Nervous Bit of Difference? Uh, a great book if you haven't. In fact, um, I know Chris, but he's in a mm. mastermind group that I'm in in America with him. We spoke to him about coming to this event. He respects his decline, so Rob's here. So never mind, but it's uh, it, Rob's second. If, if I couldn't get Chris, I'd always get Rob anyway, yeah, so yeah. You're, you're in for a treat today. Um, when, when I, I mean, when I read Chris's book, obviously, and I've read it several times, I, loads of it resonates with me, you know, and it, yeah. and it is, it, I think, to a degree. It's a little common sense, really, isn't it? 100%. Yeah, I've got no quality, you know, I've got, I, as I say to people, I've got actually no formal qualifications. It's just that since 16 years of age, I've been dealing with people and communicating yeah. with people. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, that's a really important thing to remember. Sometimes people, most people in this room, I think, are, well, all the people I know have probably started in residential property and are moving off to the, over to this commercial stuff. And people sometimes think, oh, commercial is different. Well, there are some fundamental differences between commercial and residential. But at the end of the day, we're still dealing with the property owner who is a person. Yeah. Even if it's a company, it's still a person within that company. And yeah. you, you treat it exactly the same way, don't you? Massively. I mean, we, we actually negotiate every single day. Yeah. Every conversation we have is some form of a negotiation. So I picked up on Ranjan's excellent sort of presentation earlier on, and he talked about planners. And it, immediately I made a note saying, well, maybe the conversations that you need to be perfecting is with your planners because mm. you need to get them on board. And the way to get them on board is to treat them not like planners, and treat them as the enemy, it's to treat them as your friend yeah. and understand what's driving them, what, what, how are they looking at things. You know, I've coached several hundred people now through the Mastermind program and, and over the, the events that we've run, and, and nearly always it's that the person comes at it from their point of view. Yeah. Instead of trying to understand what's driving the planner, what's driving... I've, I've had a valuer, came round and I just built rapport, started chatting to them, um, and he'd taken loads of photographs for his report. And by the end of it, he was just leaving and he went, do you know what, I'm just gonna retake some photographs. And I said, oh, why are you gonna do that? He says, because some of them don't show it in the best light that it could. Wow. He says, so I'm just gonna, for your benefit, I'm gonna take some better photographs. Yeah. And it'd be so easy for him to say, oh, I can't bother just walk out the door. Absolutely, right? but, yeah. We run first name report. terms by that. And, yeah. and you know, so it, it is all, and, and I asked Roberta earlier on, Bobby, Roberta, names are really, really important, and I'll come on to that. I've got a slide. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so well, look, let, let's go through the slides, and, yeah. and this is an important model I think people should understand because uh, I've got a, you, you give your take on this, I've got a few things I want to say as well. Yeah, That's absolutely, great. I'm sure you have. Um, <laughs> is, is that basically, we, we, I think most of us know this model, the competency model, and, I, and, and you might feel, well, he's, you know, Rob's going over all ground. I've added, a little, I've added a little tiny bit to this model in that basically unconsciously competent, you know, we, we usually get to the consciously competent and most of the people in this room are unconsciously competent. 
but going into deals, etc. And in fact, I used this um, the other day in, in one of my talks, and a very, very experienced investor came up to me, or he rang me the next day and he said, you, you don't realise it, he says, but you gave me a, a bit of a mild bollocking last night. He says, because I took on board what he said. He said, and I've reached this next stage. He says, I've become unconsciously complacent. Mm. He says, because what happened was I went into an agent, a land agent, he said, and I had a T-shirt, flip-flops, and a pair of shorts on. He said, and I realised that's not actually the impression that I want to give. Yeah. That isn't giving the impression of a professional, credible investor. He says, but I'd got so confident, oh, it's just going into a land agent. And it's just cocky almost. Almost, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So I feel if we're not careful, there's another stage that we go to, which is we become consciously complacent. And by that, I mean, we know what we should do, but we just don't do it. Mm. And when I went into senior management within the police, often what happened is a lot of the police officers fell foul of things, not because they didn't know what to do, it's just that they got complacent about doing it and they got assaulted or they got injured. And, and it happens, your contractors will do it. You know, your contractors on site. Uh, I'm sure Martin's uh, experienced it a lot, Martin Rapley, where some of the contractors become they know the cutting, and they and and they know the cutting yeah. corners. Yeah. I call it con consciously complacent. Just, just to check, does everyone understand what this model is? Think how if you know what this model is. Yeah, any questions okay, on it's it? Most, not everyone. Okay, so look, really, really quickly. So when, when you first do something, the great expression is you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So let's take driving as an analogy. Most people, probably most, I don't, but most people probably drive in this room. So when you first got into a car and you were going to learn how to drive, you were probably quite excited about that, probably a bit nervous. Not as nervous as the person next to you giving the lesson, but still, you got into the car and you had all these things to think about. What do you do with your feet and your hands? And you've got to look forward into the mirror. You've got all these things to check. And you, you just don't know what you don't know. And then you then become consciously, you, you realize that you don't know yeah. all these things. And then you start to learn with practice. You become more conscious that you actually know what you're doing. And then let me ask you a question. How many of you have had the experience where you got in the car, probably the last week, you got in the car, got out of the car, and you didn't even think about the journey, just having an autopilot. Anyone had that at all? Yeah, probably most people, because you are unconsciously competent at driving now, and that's what happens. But then as you quite often say, what happens is habits come in. But So you, you know what you're doing, you don't have to think about driving, but maybe little bad habits start coming in. Yeah, so right? what happens is, for example, and I know you're not a driver, so I can take that analogy further and say, you start to brake just a bit too late. You start to brake on a corner. But then when you hit a patch of ice, you shouldn't have braked on the corner because you become unconsciously and unconsciously yeah. complacent. You know, you've just carried on driving in different conditions exactly the same way that you always drive. And I use that analogy a lot, actually, about driving because I say that People, I, the, one of the phrases I use and I've coined is you cannot not communicate. We're mm -hmm. communicating all the time. The second Simon and I walked up on this stage, we, we were communicating. You were, you were forming an impression of what we were like from our dress, from the way we walked, and from our opening, like my opening poor joke. You started to form an impression. He's not a comedian, obviously, you know? And so you cannot not communicate. Now, people then say to me, yeah, but we, you know, I know how to communicate, Rob. I do it every single day. I do it all the time, I communicate with everybody. And I go, yeah, but it is like you're driving, is that basically you think you're a driver, but unless you've, like me, been police trained, and basically you've been taught to drive at high speeds, on motorways, in urban areas, I've been taught 4 by 4 driving, off-road, off road. I've been HGV taught, etc. That's And then I've driven in all conditions, at night time, during the daylight, in ice, in snow, in sleet, in all sorts of conditions, that's when you can start to think, well, yeah, I'm a competent driver. I really am. Yeah. And I think it's the same with communication. If we think we do it every day, therefore I'm a good communicator, mm. that's when we start. And, I, and one of the shout-outs I want to give to Andy is that he recognised in the don't let your ego get in the way, is he, is he reflected. And that's what one of the messages I'd like you to take away from this, yeah. is we just need to keep reflecting. Because although Malcolm Gladwell says 10,000 hours makes you perfect, it doesn't, actually. If you read The Dip, um, uh, sorry, if you read um, The Bounce by Matthew Sayed, which is a, a great book, he says 10,000 hours with reflection and refinement makes you perfect. Yeah. 
It's the reflection and refinement that makes you perfect, yeah. not the 10,000 hours. If you do the same thing the same way every time, you don't become perfect. Yeah. So this, this session is really to get you to think back, tell you about some of the basics, think about how yeah. do you communicate with the people who contact you, who come up on your, your alerts, the sellers you're speaking to, how do you communicate with them, and how can you make that better? And remember, there's two parts to the communication. There's not just the, the speaking, there's the listening as well. And I'd like to give you a little bit of example how we can all get better at this. So, a little, little game for you. Uh, can I see a show of hands? Who thinks they're a really good listener? Show of hands. Now, you're all being really shy here because you know I'm going to pick on someone, don't you? Okay. Okay. I'm not going to pick on anyone individual. But who thinks they're a fairly good listener? Guy, you've got the wrong go to negotiators, I think. You know, there's something, because listening is really... Let me give you an example. Okay. Let me show you how important listening is. We're going to play a game. We up for playing a game? Yeah. We up for playing a game? Yeah. Okay, right. Here's the game. The game is about listening carefully. I'm telling you what the game is about, listening carefully. So listen carefully. Right. Now, you might, have, you might want a pen and paper. You might want to write some of this down. Or you can just do it in your head. That's fine. So listen carefully. Listen carefully. Imagine you are a bus driver. This bus is going to go on a journey. It's going to go 4.4 miles north. It's going to go 3.3 miles east, 2.2 miles south, then 1.1 miles west. Were you all listening carefully? That's not good, is it, Rob? No, really? we don't know yet. Communication know yet. also involves speaking, yeah. just to check. Yeah. Were you listening, yes? Yeah, okay. Message received. So here's the question. Let's see how well you were listening to the journey. Here's the question. Now, don't say anything out. I just want to think about it yourself. Tell me, or think about, what was the colour, what is the colour of the bus driver's eyes? What's the colour of the bus driver's driver's eyes. If you know the answer, stand up. But be careful, because if you stand up, I might actually ask you to say what the colour is. Now, to be fair, there are a lot of masterminders standing up who might have heard this. A couple of times. So, so they might have heard at one of our big events. So, so don't think you're really bad if you haven't stood up yet. But I, I have given you the answer, if you were listening carefully. Let me just check. Uh, Innes, what? just say, what colour do you think the bus driver's eyes are? Green. Green. Phil? Blue. Dave? Brown. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Okay, you can sit down and out for the moment, guys. Who thinks, Simon, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> okay, I'll get to a point in a minute. <laughs> Listen again. And look, do you think if we speak to a seller, it's important to understand why they're selling, what's important? Is that important, guys? Because if we can find out what their problem is and give them what they want, there's more chance of us being able to help them. And a big problem that many investors have, they've got a list of questions they want to ask. They ask a question, and they're not listening to what the seller says or the answer. They're thinking, what's the next question I'm going to ask? Which is a big mistake, because the next question should be based on what they've just told you, not what's on your list. Does that make sense? So let me tell you about the journey again. And when you understand what colour the bus driver eyes are, you can then stand up. What I said was this. I said exactly this. I said, imagine you are a bus driver. <laughs> you might want to stand up if you know what colour. <laughs> imagine you... Are... It was the very first sentence... Oh, you sit down now, thank you. It was the very first sentence I said after the objective of this game is listening carefully, and yet... Whew, have I made a good point there? Yeah. Yeah. Guys, we need to listen and we need to respond to what those people say. Now, the way we respond, the language you use is really important. Yeah. And we're going to give you some key questions that you might want to think about as well. But this, I mean, this is a great example related to Andrew. you want to talk through this first, Rob? I really do, I, because I, had, I put this in. I, this is one of the first models I was introduced to in the police. And it's, it's cyclical, so basically, if you're not, you have to break the cycle. So Andy, I'm going to refer to you if that's okay. And it was really when you said, don't let your ego get in the way. Um, and what you were talking about there is uh, basically your attitude. So your attitude, the attitude that you come into a conversation will determine your behavior. And by that, I mean the language that you use, 
the, the, the way that you present yourself, etc. So um, if you're going into an estate agent or a land agent or whatever thinking there are no deals here, it leaks. You cannot not communicate. That will leak out in terms of your language, in terms of your confidence, in terms of your post. So Andy talked about his attitude being the ego, your, your ego. Um, and so that affected the language. But guess what happened? The other person then starts to respond. If the estate agent doesn't believe you are a credible professional uh, investor, they're not going to treat you like a credible investor or whatever. And there are ways in which you can plan and prepare, even if you've got no experience, to demonstrate experience mm. because you've got life skills you can bring. So Andy went on to say, quite honestly, and I'll give you a good shout out for the fact that you were so honest with it and shared it with us, is that it then affected their attitude, didn't it? You said their ego started to get in the way because they were responding to your ego and your language and your attitude and it affected their behaviour and all it did was go round and round and round. Mm. And the problem with that in policing was that would then, and you actually use the word, and I'll pick up on it, you use the word conflict. You said you're not going to win every, <clears throat> every conflict. Well, a negotiation shouldn't be a conflict. It can be confronting and it can be challenging, but it shouldn't be necessarily a conflict. And so basically you got into that cycle and you didn't get the deal. Who's going to break that cycle? It's down to you. You're the one with the knowledge now. You're the ones with the experience. You're the ones who can say, what's happening? And again, shout out to you. is the fact that you talk about it, which means you are reflecting on it. Because one of the big parts of my book, and I'm not sure, I don't know, for me, that Chris goes into it enough, is actually looking at your part in the conversation, your part in the negotiation, not the other person's, your part, and saying, who said what, when, why, and how? I said that, why did I say and, and to think about this in your marriages and your partnerships as well, when you've had a little tiny discussion, you know, who said I what? I love that word, that's yeah. almost remember that. Who said what, who said what, <laughs> why, when, and how? You know, why, I actually said that just purely to get back at them. It didn't help the conversation, it didn't take us any further, it was just my emotion coming out, etc. So, you know, this is a great model. If you only take one thing away from today, for me, it would be this. Because if your attitude to planners is they're there to thwart me, it will leak. It, yeah. You will communicate that. If you're, if you're thinking the value is not going to give me a proper... You don't treat them like a human being and treat them like a person and understand what's driving them, what their problems are. I was talking to a coach here who said, I've got a real problem with my plumber. And I said, well, what's going on in the plumber's life? He said, what do you mean? It's not to do with me, is it? I said, well, yeah, why don't you find out what's going on in the plumber's life? You know, can't get him on site, this, that, and the other. Came back on, he said, do you know what? We, we planned it a bit, we had a little tiny... And he said, do you know what? He said, his wife's just given birth, they're really having problems, they've got some money problems, it's just all getting on top of him. We had a really good open chat about it, about what I needed, how we could work out a schedule for him to come, and this, that, and the other. He says, he turned up the next day. Why? Because he treated him as a human being, and he listened to him, and basically, he felt, you know, that he wanted to come and help him. So that is a really important model. The, if you've had conversations that have gone wrong, start thinking about what was my attitude in that. And as I say, it was very important for the police. But it's just as in everything we do in property, it, well, everything we do in life is about building relationships. Mm. You know, and, and it, you know, you was, Andy was asked um, down here, was, you know, what was your rinse and repeat? Was it down to building a rapport? I would suggest that you're overestimated how it was down to building rapport and Ranjan as well. You know, you've got people coming to you, supplying you with deals the same as I have because I've built relationships. I haven't gone in just to screw them for one deal. And I think that's really important. Absolutely, yeah. So, let's... So uh, this, is, this is a technique from when we first kind of yeah, meet I, I, people and... and it, the, the problem is... And again, I, I feel like I'm picking on Andy, but he gave me some useful material, sorry. But he said, focus, focus on the deal. And I agree, I, you know, I, and I know there's one or two coaches in this room who feel as frustrated as I am with some people who don't actually take any action. Yeah, well, tell me about it. Yeah, <laughs> but, but the truth is they need to get the basics right as well. And, and so um, it, it, you can focus on the deal, but the danger if you focus on the deal, exactly as you said about five, ten minutes ago, is that you then do forget listening and, yeah. and silence and, and those techniques. So although I'm, what I'm going to show you is incredibly basic, right, and as Britney Spears would say, you know, it's not rocket surgery, you know, 
free Britney. She's free. You know? Um, but again, there's, there's knowing and there's doing, isn't there? There's a big yeah, difference. Yeah, I, I, right? I, had I had a mentee. You know, we go on site with them. And, and the mentee is a, a teacher. I've been teaching for 30 years. He said, Rob, I know your forte is communication. But he said, I don't, I don't, I don't suffer with that. I'm, I know how to communicate. I know how to get on with people, etc." We walked in. Didn't smile. He didn't use open gestures. He didn't forward lean. Certainly didn't touch. Eye contact was not bad. And nodding, I'll come back to nodding. Because the other N I like on there, and I would add to that, would be name. Get the person's name. Yeah. Sometimes it's difficult. McFun's difficult. I've, I was talking to Martin earlier on. You know, um, at, at breakfast this morning, I've spent all my life um, spelling out my name. People don't like saying McFun. They just don't like... Zucci. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Right at the end of the alphabet as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. so just, but, I want to... This is, this is so incredibly simple but true. Let me, let me explain something here. When you first speak to someone on the phone, that's, that's how it's going to be. How many of you generally smile when you speak to someone on the phone? Be honest here. Now, show me the smiles you use when you're on the, oh my God, we're in trouble. <laughs> but remember, it, oh, when, you, when you're on the phone, they can't see you unless you're on uh, FaceTime or something. So I want a big cheesy grin from everyone. Come on, big cheesy grin, come on. Come on, I see the teeth, come on. If you do that, by the way, only on the phone, not when you meet them, right? If you do that, you will just come across more friendly. It's just, the tone of your voice is friendly, and just, this is so, you should put this on a, on a piece of paper, and just remember this. It, it will just help you get into these very simple habits, and it's all these little things that help build the relationship and the trust, and they're more likely to want to do a deal with you. Yeah, and, and the next slide's important for that, because it's, it's my sort of technique as well. But he, he sort of said, I don't need to, you know, you don't need to do communication. He didn't do any of this. And I walked in behind him, and I, you're not going to like what I'm going to say, and, and I shouldn't have really done it. But I started to take over the conversation. I know that will be a shock to you, but... Um, <laughs> and I started dealing with the, the agent, you know. I got the price. I got the offers that they'd had. I got the previous offers, the price that they'd had, and everything out the agent and what have you. And we walked out the, the premises and he just went, well, that took it to a whole new level. I said, in what way? He said, because you just chatted. He says, you were laughing, you were jerking, and you were chatting. I was like, oh, I bet, it's ran oh, I bet you've had a few offers, haven't you? Nice little place. You know, I, I'm, I, and I, this, here's another tip that I always say to people. The property's going nowhere. You know, you can visit the property several times. What you can't do is make a first impression again. Mm. You can't start to rebuild the rapport when you've lost it when it's gone wrong, okay? So I always focus on building the rapport. In fact, and you know my partner is involved with me, so she actually goes around the property. We have a little system. She goes around the property. She does all the checking, this, that, and the other. And I do all of the talking and all the rapport building with the agents or the, the, the person showing around, etc. cetera. Um, and I got all the information I wanted just from chatting and joking and laughing, but finding common ground, which I'll come on to, with that agent. I found out about them, how far they'd travelled, how difficult the journey was. And it's like, why not? Because the humans, the, and they're it's just distressed. About, and it's not even about the property, it's about being interested in them, isn't it? Under, yeah, every time, every time. Yeah. Um, open day on a big property, uh, burnt out property. I knew the seller had been ripped off by somebody in Hull. Don't happen very often, because it's a very small, you know, actually it doesn't, genuinely, because it's a small place and we get to know who, who, who the people are. Um, but basically, there's all the developers, there's, you know, there's about 20 people going around with the bloody lasers and the tape measures and this, that and the other. And all I did was stay with the vendor. Just chatting, went around the house. I'm not interested in the house. I could, whatever, I can revisit the house. I can take the photographs. I can get the floor plans. I can do all that. You know? So but forming that relationship with the vendor, and at the end of it, it's the agent's like, right, everybody, thank you very much. You know, can you leave now? And right at the end, just as we were leaving, she said, excuse me, collared me, and just said, can I have your card, please? Yeah. Bang. And I was the one who got the phone call, you yeah. know? Didn't get the deal, because she wanted far, far too much for it, <laughs> but, you know. But at least you were in the running, right? And massively, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and I, so for me, it's about being confident. So, you know, it's about being credible. Your intro and your clothing, like that lad, don't go in in... And, and, I like clothing as well, and the reason I talk about clothing is what I didn't describe, is when I left the police, I actually became an NLP practitioner, a neuro-linguistic programming pr practitioner, and also a hypnotherapist. So um, I went into hypnotherapy for a while. 
Um, and it's amazing how you can actually anchor confidence with the right clothing. Mm. You know, and we all have what's known as routines or habits, etc. You can actually create confidence with clothing. Right, the work, you know, you wear the same shirts all the time when you're That's doing. Have I, I got one? Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll speak about that now later. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's it, and it's you. You have little tiny things that you get dressed in will give you confidence. You you know, you going into a certain circumstances, you put on certain clothing. You can do exactly the same in property. You know, what's my outfit for going viewing properties? What's my outfit for presenting, or what's my outfit for meeting investors? It's a bit yeah. like you know. I think when so many people worked from home because of furlough, yeah. a lot of people started, you know, not really getting dressed for yeah, work yeah. and stuff. But actually, yeah. even if you work from home, if you, if you get dressed, whatever that might be, it might be a suit and tie, whatever, and you go to a designated place in your house that's your workplace, it feels like you've gone to work. Otherwise, where's the boundary between yeah. being at home or, you know, it, it definitely changes your psyche, doesn't it, by, by yeah, dressing I, the right way. The other thing as well is that, for example, in, when I was a police officer, I had a uniform, obviously. And I wore a uniform for nearly 34 years, except when I was in certain departments. But when I put that uniform on, I wasn't Rob McFun. I was a police officer. PC plod. Absolutely, for quite a long time. And when people were having a go at me, I never felt like it was personal. And a lot of people will say, oh, you've got the worst job in the world. You know, people having a go at you, spitting at you, da, da, da. And I, and I get all that. But the reality is I never once took it personally. Mm. Only once when somebody threatened to burgle my house um, and he said, I know where you live, and he threatened my family. And suddenly, even in my head, I just flipped. I didn't hit him or anything, but, you know, because he was behind bars. But um, I would have done, I think. It, <laughs> but, you know, when somebody threatens your family, that's totally different, isn't it, from have a go at me, whatever you want, but don't have a go. At the and that, that's the only time in 34 years that I ever actually flipped. So the, the clothing made it so that you, you can actually go to see planners in that clothing and you know that they're not having a go at you personally. It's when my HMO, I've got 34 objections to my HMO, and I went round the objectors. I went round to meet them. That was a difficult, some difficult conversations, but I had to completely control my emotions because I said, look, it's a democratic process. You've got every right to object to my HMO. I don't have a problem with that, but let's have a chat about it. Yeah. You know? And it kept it really you know, sort of professional, it kept it, it gave me a, a human touch with them as well, but it also meant when I got approval, which I knew I would get approval eventually, um, it meant I've got a great relationship still with all of those people, because yeah. I bothered to do that. So, credible, your intro is plan and prepare your intro, you know? Um, and I was talking to, I was mentoring, uh, coaching somebody the other day, um, he's from Dubai, and I said, okay, well the first thing is, can you get a mortgage in the UK? He says, yeah, we're completely set up, uh, you know, I've got the right directors in the company and done it right with solicitors and accountants, so I am mortgageable in this country. I said, okay. And he told me earlier on that he was getting absolutely no response from agents, land agents, and things like that. And I said, so at what point do you tell them that you're mortgageable? And he goes, I don't. And I go, if you were in their position, do you not think that they might think, he lives in Dubai, it's nothing but problems. I might as well, I'd prefer to have a UK investor. It's more straightforward, this, that, and the other. And he said, I never give it a thought. And when I say to people, put yourself in the other person's position, what do they want to hear? Credibility, they want to hear that you're professional, you're credible, that you're ready to go ahead, that you're interested, you're looking to build a long-term sustainable, we, we talked about that, a long-term sustainable portfolio. You talk about going in and saying, I'm looking to buy two properties, but it's exactly the same theory, yeah. is, yeah, I am, I am who I say I am. I'm authentic. And, and, you know, that's something that came out of Andy's, you know, ex-forces, be authentic. So, so, for, so for UKPA, when, when speaking to a landlord, I mean, they may have a deal that's of interest or it may not be, but I think a, a way to build extra credibility with them could be to say, look, I'm, I'm part of this big national organisation. Uh, I'm interested in buying some commercial property now, but actually, if it's not right for me, I've got a whole load of other people all around the country who also might be interested. And certainly, they're not just speaking to you as a potential, they, you have access to a load of potential buyers, and so maybe it's worth them spending a bit more time talking to you. And I think that's what people miss when they come to these events. Mm. They don't actually write down what you've said. 
Well, they can listen to the audio, maybe. Yeah, or watch yeah, the video. and they ought to, because Simon's just told you exactly how to position it. Now, you don't have to use Simon's exact words, because I wouldn't do that, because then it might make, sound Make a bit, them your words. Make them your but that's words, the principle but the principle is that. It's exactly. not just you, yeah. it's this whole network of people around the country, and anybody who's selling a property, they want to make sure that someone's going to buy it. Yeah. And that's the biggest problem, because one in three sales we know in residential market fall through. And often it's because of trouble with finance, et cetera. So if, but if you don't want the deal, I know a whole load of people who might also want the deal. So you're implying it's really worth speaking to you about the property they want to sell. And thus opening up and giving you some of the information. And that's something else in terms of, um, uh, when I speak to it, I would say, look, um, there are lots of things we could do here. And what I love to do is ask you some great questions so that I can really understand what you're looking to achieve and see if I can then come up with a solution that might work for you. Because you're the one coming up with the solution. Yeah. And until they give you all that information, and I mean all the information, you can't do it. You? You can't do it. And, I, and I'm sure Dave will confirm it, Sarah and, 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 and the other coaches in here, is that the amount of times that people say, I've got a great lead, Rob, and it's going to be a great PLO. And I go, well, tell me about the mortgage conditions. And they go, well, I haven't asked them. Well, how do you know it's a PLO then? How do you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. You've not listened to Simon. Yeah. This is what you need to do. So this is just reinforcing what I said before, really. Be curious about then. I'm that awful person that you sit next to on the train or on the plane and you just think, <laughs> yeah, I've got four hours to myself. I can just chill and relax. And then I start and asking. Chirpy Rob you. starts asking questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and by the end of the flight, I know everything about you. You know, it's not all about me, you know. But, you know, it, it just it stems from I like to actually find common ground. And, and somebody yeah. sent me a photograph about um, a property he was going to view. And in the photograph was uh, a bookshelf with books and stuff on it. And then, and I've given the clue away already, but basically a massive crack down the, down the wall. And I said, uh, tell me what you see in that photograph. And he said, well, I see the crack. And I said, well, I don't see the crack. I said, the crack's there, it's not going anywhere. We ob it's obvious, the crack is obvious. We've got to talk about the crack at some point, but the reality is, Tell me what's on the, on the bookshelf. Yeah. Anyway, well, there's a load of jazz albums and there's some jazz. I said, right, so what's that tell you about the vendor? Mm. Is there any common ground? Yeah. Their genre of music, what's your genre of music? So I was. By, by the way, don't make it up. Oh, if God, they no. like jazz and no. you don't like don't try and blag it because no. That, no. No. that is not a good thing to do. No. Nope. Okay. But obviously, the, the, what I'm trying to get across there is find, you know, you'll see pictures out, even on a Zoom, on a pin meeting, I look behind the person who's on the Zoom to see what pictures there are or ornaments there are, and immediately it's like, oh, it's a great picture of a, an elephant there. Have you, have, you, have you ever visited elephants? Have you, you know, which yeah. I can because. You know, I've been yep. to South Africa a lot. Yep. So the reality is I know, I, and, and when you reach a certain age, like me, you can find common ground in, in anything. You know, yeah. I've been out loads of places. I've, you know, you see, I think you mention it, you know. Ah, oh, see so your children have graduated. Where did they graduate from? What did they graduate in? Just find mm -hmm. common ground, because that's where the connection will come. I want that person to want to sell it to me, even if my price is lower. And yeah. you've experienced that, I've experienced yeah. that, where I've not put in the highest price, I've still got the deal. Yeah. I've still got, and, and a great story about, and, and I know Dan was involved in it, one of the masterminders, um, you know, somebody was offering 600,000 pound cash for the same property that they were offering 600,000 on a PLO. And the person gave them the PLO and turned down 6, 600,000 pound cash in the hand because we had discussed with the, with the mentor how to build that rapport and find out exactly what it is that that person... I said, she said, why, why, would, why would they not accept 600,000 in cash? I said, because they'd have done it already. They'd have accepted that deal already. So there's something somewhere that's stopping them holding them back from accepting 600,000 cash. And an example we need to in that case might be, well, if they were just going to put it in the bank, it's going to do nothing for them. They didn't whereas, need the money. Whereas a PLO, about... they're still getting an income from, from that project about the hassle. So. What it, what, in, in that particular instance, which I want, it's a long story, but basically they wanted it renovating in a sympathetic way because they'd lived in it for 40 years. Right. They didn't need the money. Money was not the issue. Speed was not the issue. It was a sympathetic refurbishment. So the mentor, we agreed, the mentor went back and said, would you like to be involved in the redevelopment of the, of the building? 
Would you like yeah. to have oversight of the plans and things like that? No decision making, but would you just like to have an input? <laughs> Seal the deal. That's all it was. Seal the yeah. deal. And, but that only came from understanding what's driving that person. Because everybody buys and sells on emotion. Yeah. And all deals are done on emotion. And for a lot of people, it, it is the money. Mm. And sometimes the more well, money that's is, the is the one. Yeah. But, but not all the time. And that's what you've really got to remember. Yeah. It's not always about the money. There are yeah. other things that, that sometimes have far more value than money. Mm. Very, very important. Okay? And the money might be the most important thing because that's what's driving them at the time. COVID changed lots of people's drivers last year. Mm. You know, they went from, you know, it's like, so, and think, think about it this way. So, because we're looking at commercial property, right? So, probably for the first time, Ranjan can probably back us up on this. Commercial property, there are some real benefits over residential. The main one being that when you're a landlord, you give it to a tenant, it's full insuring, repairing lease, they look after it. Every quarter, they pay your rent like clockwork. And then last March 2020 was the first time ever that blue chip companies were turning around to landlords saying, ah, we're not going to pay this quarter. What do you mean you're not going to pay? Uh, we're not going to pay. Shop shut. First time ever. And so there are some commercial landlords who have been used to this truly passive income coming. have suddenly gone, what the hell? Maybe this isn't as guaranteed. Maybe it's not as good as I thought. Maybe there's, you know, the world is changing. Maybe I should sell this commercial property. And they're not thinking about developing it into a residential unit. They're thinking the commercial use here might be a problem. They think, ah, this mug wants to buy this commercial property for me. Brilliant. They don't know what we're going to do with it. And we probably shouldn't really tell them what we're going to do with it. And I think Ranjan really emphasised it as well this morning with in, all about buying, you know, from motivated sellers. Yeah, you know, always. It, because you're bringing the knowledge, you yeah. can buy it at even sometimes above the market value. Absolutely. Harder in the north, and I agree with you 100% in relation to the end value really puts, uh, you know, a level on what we can do but so some of the common themes that I get from my coaching is um, they don't fact find they adopt a position first like I said you know I, I've got a lead it's going to make a really good up purchase option instead of doing the fact find you know first impressions build rapport find out exactly what the issues are and what's driving them they miss those cues they don't we all think I know mean, you've just done that excellent exercise about you know you are the bus driver but honestly, if you reflect on what you've actually missed, and, and it, it really brought it home to me when we used to listen to the interviews of suspects and witnesses, we used to listen afterwards and used to think, I had them. I had them at that point, but I just didn't pick up on it. The body language changed, the tone of the voice changed, everything changed. That was the key question that I should have then driven home. It's a, so I was just try, it was just a really good tip here, if you want to become really good at conversations with sellers, what you should do is record the conversation. Now, obviously, if you record a conversation, you're going to use it, you should tell someone. But if it's just for your own personal use, no one's ever going to know, right? Shh. And if you listen back to that recording, just as Rob said, like the police will listen back to interviews, you will pick stuff and you will think, oh my God, I didn't pick that up. At, or I should have asked this, and you'll just get better at the process. So it's a very simple thing to do. And if you do a Zoom, most of the Zooms are recorded, and they probably wouldn't think anything of it, of it being recorded if you're having a Zoom with them. And I think actually an initial conversation, rather than on the phone, if you could get an email and maybe have a quick conversation, hey, look, can we have a video conference? Because if you can actually see them in front of you, I think it's much easier to pick up the body language, oh, yeah. isn't it? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And, and it is picking up those nuances, and it is a skill, like, like anything else, you need to hone that skill. You need to practice it and hone yeah. it. Um, and we listen to respond. And, and I was a little careful what I was going to say. I was, uh, I, was, I was mentoring somebody, and I had to shut them up. You know, it, continually. It's like, stop finishing my sentences. You know, listen to what I'm saying at times, rather than immediately wanting to come back in and respond with something. And being Because at the end of the day, if you're doing this, if you are replicating this out there, you are not going to get any deals mm. because you're not listening to understand, you're just listening to respond. And if you really want to watch that, people watching, just basically you know, watch, watch everybody when they're in coffee. You know, people's, you know, we'll be talking and suddenly I'm leaning forward to start to talk and you aren't even finished. You know, we, we all do it. It's a real skill. I call it the six second silence sometimes. Ask a question, listen to the answer, and wait and count to six. Chris talks about when someone says something, you listen to it, and 
before you say anything, you kind of repeat back to them what they've said, because it just re shows you were listening to them as well. Yeah, so we, 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 I've got a model for that from the, from the police, which was probe, probe, clarify, summarize. Yeah. So somebody says something, I need to clarify with you. I need to probe what you're talking about there. What does that, so you say you've got a large garden. What do you mean by a large garden? What's that look like? Have you got any measurements, this, that, and the other? Okay, so just to reaffirm then, it's X, Y, and Z at, at key points in the conversation yeah. on key point. So, and it's okay if, if they've said something you don't understand to, oh, to yeah. dig deep and clarify. Don't just say, okay, fine, and move on. Say, no, sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite, what did you mean by that? Can yeah. you explain yeah. that? Because yeah. sometimes people do contradict themselves. Sometimes they, they say one thing, then, then, then it's changed. So mm. it's okay to say, sorry, what was that again? Or I thought, I, maybe I misheard you. I thought mm. you said this. Yeah, I mean, somebody, sim as simple as, yeah, I'm looking for the cash. Oh, okay. Yeah, what are you going to do with the cash? What are you looking to? Are you going to enjoy it? You know, are you looking to go on a holiday with it? And you can do it in a way that isn't saying, "Tell me what you're going to do with the cash." Yeah, it's conversational. It's, it's isn't conversational. It? It's like, oh, that'd be a nice little amount. Are you going on holiday? Yeah. And and it's like a leading question, but it's a leading question that you have I've put in deliberately because I know you'll probably counter it with what you're actually going to do. Yeah. It's a bit manipulative. I know it feels that, but you know, um, and and. It really is important to pick up on those cues. So like cash would be, so what are you going to do with it? Do you need all the cash? Or do you just need some of the cash? Because it, I mean, you do a great exercise, don't we? We do a great exercise on Mastermind Accelerator where they don't actually need all the equity from the property, mm. but their solution, I often joke with my coaches and say, if somebody tells you they're selling the house, what are they looking to do? And they go, well, sell the house. I go, well, maybe not. They haven't got the knowledge. They don't know about rent to rent, purchase options, purchase lease options, etc. You do. Their solution to their problem with the limited knowledge that they've got is to sell that property or sell that business. You're the one coming in with the knowledge. But you don't know exactly what they want until you've asked all the right questions. So don't make assumptions. Yeah, they want the cash. What do you want the cash? You know, probe and clarify. Mm. And this is a biggie for me. I don't know what the other coaches' experiences is, but they'll say, yeah, I've had one meeting, and then they've gone in straight with the deal. And, and this I really find strange, because you know, I know um, Andy talks about wealth dynamics. I do use wealth dynamics, as you know. I'm a flow consultant, and I do use others as well. I use disk profiling and things like that. I'm a supporter, so I like talking. I like talking face-to-face. -face. I find it very strange that somebody goes, they have a couple of meetings, and then they try and explain something as complicated as a purchase lease option in an email. I go, ah, oh, I've lost the deal. They think I'm a charlatan. I think I'm, I go, why? They go, well, I, I tried to explain it in the email. I said, so you've gone to the, you've gone to the extent of building rapport. You, you, you've got this really great relationship with them. And then you try and explain it in, in word, you know, in an email. Guess what? As a supporter, I'd have gone, What's he, what's he sent me an email for? What's he, and, and I said, the other thing as well is you're trying to explain something that you've understood, you've had explained to you several times probably, you've learned about purchase options or rent to rent or other ways of doing creative deals. <coughs> you're coming at it with so much knowledge, they've got none, and you're trying to concertina and force it into them so that they understand what it is that you're trying to achieve in an email. Well, you imagine people, I suspect people have read your book, but they still don't grasp some mm. of the concepts in that book, yeah. and the same in mine. Yeah. You need to have that discussion about it. So they haven't built the rapport sufficiently and gone straight into the deal. And I understand about taking action. I understand about being focused. But for me, the, two, the first and the last ones, to me, it's about go out there, fact find, find out what it is, get, get lead. You, you, you're not going to do anything without leads. And then when you got those leads, you're not going to do anything until you found out all the information from that person. Yeah. Great. Oh. Let, let's, before we do those, yep. uh, can I share a couple of good fact-finding questions with you? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so three of you want to know, come up here. And uh, <laughs> would you like to know some good fact-finding yeah. questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of these you're going to know that we obviously might want to jot some of these down. So uh, a couple of questions uh, you might want to ask are, um, and obviously this is, in reference to commercial property, but this could be used for residential as well, is are there any time scales you're working to? Are there any time scales you are working to? Because we want to understand, look, maybe the reason they want to sell this is because the lease and the tenants is running out. Or something's changed for them. Or their personal circuit. Are there any time scales you're working to? Because that's a great indication on motivation. 
Um, what's more important to you, to get the money in the bank as quick as possible or get as much as you possibly can from the sale of this property? What's most important, to get the money in the bank as quick as possible or get as much as you can from the sale of this property? Because that's a great indication. Look, do they, do they really need the money for something now? And actually a quick sale, maybe at a slightly lower price, is what you're suggesting. Or actually maybe you can give them a bit more if they're a bit more patient, if they let you get an option on it. So you can get your planning, get your uplift that Ranjan talked about. So again, trying to understand their motivation about what's really important to them. Um, and then I believe that when you make an offer, you don't really want them to accept the offer that you make. Because if you make an offer and they accept it, in my view, you've probably paid too much. So I kind of want them to say no. Now, I want, I want to know roughly what they want. When I make an offer to them, expecting them to say no, thus I'm not scared about making an offer. I'm not saying, oh, please, they say no. I, I kind of expect them to say no. But then I'll go back with a question. OK, so that didn't work for you. What would work for you? Instead of you going back and making a second offer, you say, what would work for you? Because then sometimes just coming up a few thousand pounds is like a psychological win for them. Because you made a low offer, they rejected it, and actually they made you pay more money. But they've come up with a price. And, and you know what? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And remember that there are so many properties out there. They have to sell this property. We don't have to buy this property. It's got to be a win for them and also a win for you. And with time these people become more motivated. With using DNA, obviously, is a great way to follow up with these leads, and we can have the initial conversation. If we can't do a deal now, we always want to leave the door open and say, hey, look, OK, it didn't quite work now, but let's keep in touch, and, and maybe your circumstances or my circumstances change. Maybe we can do something in the future. So a few little questions there, which I think will, will help you. Mm. Um, and, and I believe you should make an offer on everything. Everything you look at, every setting, you should make an offer. But obviously, you adjust the offer compared to how much you actually want the property. If it, you, know, you might say, well, I really don't want that. But there will be a price, a low price, at which that is a really good deal. So I'd make an offer on everything. However, if you are going to make a low offer, there's a risk of losing some of the rapport. So here's something that, that, that I use and we teach that might be useful for you. If you're going to make a really low offer on something, you, you might say, look, well, actually, um, I like the property. Uh, I think it would work well in my portfolio. The only problem is the price that I could afford to give you is probably way below what you would accept. And although I, I would like to buy the property, for that reason, I am not going to make an offer because I don't want to upset you. you know, I really like you, <clears throat> and I don't want to insult you, and I know the offer will be a lot more than you would want. So, and, and then you shut up. Now, if they're motivated, they're going to say, well, well, no, go on, mate. I'm OK. Make me an offer. He said, no, no, well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, but I really don't want to upset you. It's going to be really low. It's going to be not as much as you want, and I don't want to upset you. He said, no, no, I'm OK. I can take it. So they are asking you to make an offer, and you've already said you don't want it because you don't want to upset them. So when you make a low offer, they might be a bit shocked, but they can't really be annoyed with you because you're the one who said, no, I don't want to upset you. Does that make sense? It's a really good way of making low offer. And you know they're going to reject it. So look, I, I knew it wouldn't work for you, but no, what, what would work for you? And it's amazing what people come back with. So just a little tip there. And if you want to add to that, Rob. Well, yeah, it's just about posi you've positioned it, haven't you? Yeah. You, you've done what Chris would say in his book, an, an, an accusatory audit or whatever. And, and often it's amazing. Now, you know, if you go into a conversation and you go, look, you're not going to like what I'm going to say, but I feel I've got to say it. You yeah. know, you, you've already started to lay the foundations for this is going to be a challenging conversation or, mm. or whatever in a relationship or anything like that. But that's all you're doing there. And it's and like I say with the coaches about how he, the credibility when you're going in with the state agents. Well, yeah, I'm new, I'm doing a course, etc. Well, if you go in thinking oh, I'm new and I'm doing a course and they're going to think I don't know what I'm doing, then that's how you, you're going to communicate yeah. and that's how it's going to come across. So maybe if you go in and position it slightly differently to say, you know, Property's, you know, a bit risky, isn't it? You know, people lose money in property, don't they? You know, so, so based on that, I want to be able to do it properly. Yeah. You know, so I'm surrounding myself. You know, I'm working with people who I can draw on and use their experience and their knowledge, mm. because I want to make sure I don't make the same mistakes. Yeah. You know, and I'm in this for the long term. I've just positioned the fact that I'm on a mastermind course, 
without sounding like I don't know what I'm doing and I'm new and I'm fresh and I'm a newbie. And I actually turn it around slightly as well and say, and I'd really like your help. Yes, make, with an agent, make them yeah. the expert. Yeah, Absolutely. because yeah. obviously you've got the knowledge of the area and et cetera. So, you know, I'd like you to help me build my portfolio. And yeah. Who doesn't like to help people? Very, well, estate agents, obviously. But, you know, <laughs> it's very rare, isn't it? So you're pandering again to that human nature, the human emotions of it. You so know? look, we, we've yep. talked yeah, way we too much. So, yeah. so let, we're going to do some exercises. Do, and we're going to do, uh, we're going to have two tables. We've got four exercises. And we're going to split them to those two. We'll do the first one. Then we'll have maybe the one at the back of this one here. We'll do the second one. Then maybe these two will do the third one. And those two will do the fourth one. Yep. Okay? And so if we can hand those exercises out, please. So exercise one for these two tables, please. Exercise two for one at the back and this one here. Exercise three for these two at the front and exercise four for the two back there. And Bob, do you want to just talk through these? Um, uh, well, no, we we'll just, just, we'll just, just leave it. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. So, so what we're going to do, we're going to give them 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 to yeah, 15 do, maximum. Yeah. So we're going to be, we'll start with 10 minutes and see how that goes. And what we want to do is read. So, so each table has got a case study. Everyone's got the same information on, on your table. And we want to discuss it as a group. How would you approach this particular situation? There are four different situations. Uh, we'll get you to do it in tables, first of all. And, and what I'd like to do, guys, listen carefully. Can you put a ha Everyone put your hand up like this. Everyone, everyone oh, yeah. put listening skills. Everyone put your hand up like this. On the count of three, bring your hand down and point to one person on your table. One, two, three. <laughs> whoever you're pointing at, whoever's got the most people pointing at them is the spokesperson. So, guys, you need a spokesperson on each table. And that spokesperson is going to give feedback about how your table felt you would deal with this. And there are prizes. Ooh. Yeah. So we'll give you 10 minutes. We'll be back in 10 minutes, guys. Okay, guys, if you could start wrapping up, please. So, Rob, do you want to, um, do you want to share with everyone what... Uh, challenge was one was please and we'll go to the tables who had who had number one because we despite the very clear instructions the Dan obviously decided to do different tables that's completely fine so so <laughs> these two for one yeah I think yeah right so these two here so basically what you've probably gathered just by reading this one on the on the uh, PowerPoint is that most of the text is exactly the same except for the third paragraph which is going to vary between the challenges. So the, your challenge was basically, it's a family-run business, uh, and you actually get to realise that you're not negotiating with the only decision-maker, and there's a strong patriarchal character in the background. So how do you approach it, etc.? So, so um, who's a spokesperson? Well, apparently me, because I got handed the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to, you when you get the microphone, you like to introduce yourself, say where you're from, so we'll kind of get to know each other a bit better Hi, as well. I'm Nick, I'm from Bristol. Hi, Hi Nick. Nick. Um, right, so our challenge was yeah, a strong uh, um, patriarchal character in the background of a business, not necessarily property, but a business. So um, we have had experience, Innes has got experience in this, so they, that came to the table, which was really helpful. Um, I think the bottom line was we needed to first try and untangle the web, which is obviously in their, in their family business. So we needed to work out whether it was a, um, an emotional tie with the patriarch or whether it's a, like a legal tie with shareholdings and all that kind of stuff. So you've got to kind of try and get through and break through to get some clarity and all that. And then obviously you've got to bring, them, bring the various parties in of their family to try and get to the table to kind of discuss stuff. But you're not going to park the person you're dealing with to just obviously go straight through mm. to the patriarch. You're going to have to try and, without offending them, you need to kind of create a scenario where you're talking to them, working with them, and actually get them to the decision maker so they can make a decision. Um, yeah. I think that was pretty much, in sort of 20 words or less, pretty much the nub of it. Was there anything else, really, that um, was outstanding? Yep. I think it was also trying to understand everybody's various wants mm. and needs. Mm. Um, I got this going on at the moment. Um, everybody, the, the four other shareholders have very different profiles and um, they want different things, or they may. And historically, the difficulty that we've experienced is actually getting them to um, address those and coming to any form of a collective decision. And it might require a third, a skilled third party um, who they, Media. a trusted advisor or a, a mediator, an independent to, to come in and actually 
draw out of each of them um, what they actually want without perhaps the influence of the strong patriarchal person yeah. above. Um, it, it's a very tricky challenge. That's exactly it, because oft, and often they don't know what they want. And if they do, how on earth can you give them such they don't know what they want? So that idea of a third party helping them facilitate making that decision is a really, really good idea. And I think right. the other thing that we also realised is that, um, well, it, it, there might have been a response to um, a letter or whatever, but do they actually really want to sell this? Is, it, it might be one person going, yeah, I want to sell it. Mm -hmm. um, and the others are going, well, what the hell's going on? So, yeah, that's great. Go on, back to Sorry, I'm just going to finish off with my saying, um, yeah, you're going to need to, whether it's a price issue or whether it's a personal <laughs> emotional issue, that's mm. where the, you know, when you're having a problem in the background, you need to kind of get to what that might be. Yeah, great. Excellent. Let's give this table a round of applause. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so we go to the next one. And is whoever's the spokesperson on that table. Uh, yep, yeah, great. So, Phil, stand up. And tell us who you are, where you're from. Uh, yeah, Phil Bygrave, uh, Manchester. Um, I run Rami Property Group. I was on Simon's Mastermind 30 cohort. Um, so I'll do it ABC, if that's good, just so mm -hmm. it logically works in my brain. So how do you approach the challenge? I think um, this is a difficult one because it's a patriarchal character. Uh, and therefore, I think it's really important to try and understand um, the actual um, legal framework and financial framework surrounding the deal because if there is if it's somebody who's only an influencer as a decision maker that changes the dynamic and potentially how you could approach it uh, if the if you're negotiating with somebody who's the sole shareholder of the property or the business that you're purchasing but they're being influenced by somebody who in effect wiped their ass at zero years old or whatever it was then there's a there's a relationship there which might be just on an influencing basis um, and you can relate to that because you, that's more relatable because I, I, you know, the only person I can't sell to is my mum and dad. You know, it's, it's, that, it's that simple. So um, you can actually then bring in a, a more relatable conversation. Um, so first and foremost is understand, is trying to, trying to subtly draw out what the actual physical environment is that you're negotiating on. Um, the second one would then be to push towards an open conversation and probably in an informal setting and not necessarily at the property um, so trying to get the influencer uh, in the room, uh, maybe over a coffee or, you know, something like that where it's informal, you can just try and build a rapport with the second party. Um, and in that environment, you can try a couple of things. Um, you can pre-warn, you can, if there's a relationship there where it's, 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 it's only influencer, you can offer to play bad cop a little bit, you know, on behalf of the vendor. So you can almost team up with them to say, right, let's, let's attack it in the way that we, we can attack it together. Uh, if it is an actual share, shareholding environment, then obviously you need to approach it as in actually this person is a, is a decision maker. And uh, as the team here was saying, um, you don't want to isolate the original negotiation uh, attendee either. You don't want to, the, whoever the son or daughter is, you don't want to isolate them. So you do, you'd probably want to bring them into the same room and just play a little bit of devil's advocate across both parties uh, in that conversation. Um, and ultimately, you're trying to get to the common ground across both parties, and there might not be one. You've got to enter into a converse, every com every negotiation with this. Might this is pro probably not going to work, so there's no problem with me asking as many questions as possible. Uh, see, personal experience of so sales for 20 years, m many many family businesses, um, it, they were actually much easier to deal with than corporate businesses, if I'm honest, because corporate businesses you might never ever get to mm. meet the key decision mm. maker, you know. I used to trade with BP. I never met Tony. What's his face? You know, whoever that that, that, that chap was who used to run BP when the when the tanker blew up or whatever. Um, so the influence, the inf there's always key decision makers that you may not get to meet, and in that case, you you know, you'd have to change your dynamic to be actually get the idea into the seller or the person you are negotiating with and try and make it their idea as yeah. well. And then you can try and maybe even teach them one or two of the things that you're teaching here, which is. Well, why don't we lowball the decision? Why don't you lowball the decision maker? And then when he says no, then go with the offer that we've agreed and see if they say yeah. yes. Something like that. Right, excellent. Thank you, Phil. Let's give that sort of round of applause as well, please. Um, some, some great comments there, Phil. One thing I, I will challenge you you said that you, you, the only people you couldn't sell to is your mum and dad. You've been negotiating with and selling to your mum and dad your whole life. And we all have, right? Yes, great. Who is uh, ex tables number two? two I, this? I just want to pick oh, up on, sorry, on, on that. Yeah, uh, I think you're 100% right. Um, and I think for me, one of the things that I do is it, 
I now know I'm almost in a uh, facilitating training scenario where it's like I need to help that person approach that for mm. that person. So yep. I give that exactly as you said, Phil, giving them ideas about how they can frame it. Have you thought about framing it like this? Have you thought about approaching it like this? Some of the questions you might, so I go into almost trainer mode, yep. if you like, and, and run a little tiny, you know, this is what's happening. You know, I, you know, I'm not beyond sort of sitting with somebody saying, I think what's happening in this dynamic is this, you know, with my wealth dynamics background and with this. So I'm not averse to saying, do, 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 do you understand what's going on here? I think what's going on here is this, this and this and help them understand the dynamic that they're in as well so that they can approach. And, and, and they sometimes can't see it if they're in it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you so almost give them some ideas and, and, and that's one of the ways that I approach it. Right. Particularly with probate. With this will happen, you, this will come across this one, why Rob put this in an example, so hopefully that was really useful for you. Let's move to challenge number two, shall we? Yeah. Yep. So again, third paragraph, the only thing is the, the owner is valuing it as a business, whereas you see, like uh, Ranjan said earlier, really you're interested in the building and the land opportunity mainly. So it's whether it's a business or whether it's land and, and opportunity. So. so who's the spokesperson? Yeah, so hi, uh, oh, okay. Darren Sharp, um, I live in Warwick, uh, so I've just finished Mastermind 29 with Simon. Uh, so, hi, Darren. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, so this is a business uh, and we, we're looking at the land and the property. So first thing, how do we approach? Um, it's got to be openly and with curiosity. It, what's the business about? What is there an emotional attachment? Is it just they want to get rid? Is COVID really changed things for them? You know, what's the real driver? Um, are they being realistic, unrealistic? Uh, is it an ongoing um, business? You know, so that's the first thing. Um, there might be some educating. So to say, hey, look, this is where the market is right now. This is what we're observing. We do appreciate all of this. They probably do, but they just don't want to hear it. Um, and uh, it could be that uh, the business is ongoing. They want to move property uh, lo lo location. Um, we also need to think about where the property is held. Is it in a SaaS? Does it link through to the to the business? You know, what, what's what's the structure of, of how the property is held? So, um, really, if if the business is um, viable, then how do we help them? And if the business is not viable, then it's an open conversation to say, hey, look, you know, appreciate you've you've had all these years, or you know, you've got your family, you just want to get rid. Um, what we can do is do a property deal and really lay it out quite openly without taking too long about it. Um, I know some people would say, you know, you've got to build rapport, and I totally agree with that, but it shouldn't have to take weeks or months to do that. Yeah. It should be something um, built from integrity, uh, built from a really open dialogue uh, between people. Um, from personal um, stuff, I've been buying and selling businesses at corporate level for a long time, so uh, not smaller stuff. I'm actually doing um, buying one business right now uh, on a PLO, funny enough. Uh, so, uh, uh, so yeah, I, I, I have seen this and I do do this sort of stuff every day. So it is about working with people and it is about um, intently listening with curiosity and being absolutely authentic. I think that really works for me. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Round of applause. Thank you for that. I, again, I, I, I'm going to point out the obvious here. You've just heard that Darren does this quite regularly, buying, selling businesses, has done it at a corporate level. You've now got a fantastic contact in the room if you come across this problem to say, can I have a bit of advice? You know, and I'm sure he would charge the right amount, but you know, give you advice. So I think it's picking up on what people say of, of their experience and knowledge and what they've done and, and yeah. using the, the, the network in the room. There was a lot of expertise and... and Experience yeah. in this room, absolutely, yeah. that's great, thank you. Uh, this table, I think, was the next one, that's why. Hello everyone, my name is Walid, Walid Ibrahim, uh, from London. And this is what our table came up with. Letter A, I think first step, what we need to do is, we got the deal, uh, we need to do the fact find, get all the details and everything sorted, and then from there, build a rapport with uh, the vendor. Um, from there, he has his own uh, avenue he's trying to go to. I think a lot of the other tables said this as well. You understand their motivation and then from there, maybe provide them with other options. And if that doesn't work, you may want to also 
uh, consider other options like, for example, if we move, uh, move on to C, where, uh, uh, where it says, what are your options? What would you consider? You could consider to you know, buy the business as a whole, give the vendor what he wants, and then from there sell the business, liquidate the business, and then from there keep the property, the building. So there's avenues that you can take. It's just about uh, presenting that to the vendor and then coming to a win-win situation. Yeah. Uh, from uh, C, these two actually have had this experience before. And what they've done was, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, hi, um, I'm Surit Patel. I'm from London as well. Um, just go through my own personal experience of uh, being in this situation, but as a seller, um, it was a, a very old business that uh, had a, quite a large warehouse in Streatham, um, and um, it was a wholesaler, um, and there were four different um, partners involved. Um, they wanted to sell the business, and I was one of them. Um, in that situation, we were thinking whether to sell the business or to sell uh, the assets. Um, and I had to sit down with them because none of them had any experience in property. So we literally sat down in the warehouse and wrote down, you know, this is the value of the warehouse as a commercial investment. This is how much it would be with, the, with planning and how much it would be once it was developed. Um, and through that process, we agreed that probably the best way was to just liquidate the actual stock and um, go through a planning process to get planning. And then we sold the, sold the property with planning. Um, but it was a journey because the individuals, you know, the shareholders, the other shareholders had no experience at all in property. So it was very much the key there was education. And once they understood the whole process, it was quite easy to actually um, get the whole thing um, done. Yeah. It, it's a really good point because we need to remember that probably, not always, but probably, we probably have a, a higher level of degree of education and knowledge around what can be done in property. And someone might be a very successful business owner, or they might be a significant property owner, but that doesn't mean they understand and know some of the things we know. And taking them on that journey through a thought process to look at what their options and alternatives are, then we can help them get to a great solution for them that hopefully works for us as well. So really important. Rob, anything to add to that? No. No? no. no. Okay, great. Let's round, round applause to this table, please. Thank you. <laughs> Challenge three. Uh, there's a typo in this one. Um, challenge three is the owner has an unrealistic expectation as to the value and appears not to be prepared to move from that value. Yes, and that happens all the time, they're unrealistic. So. Unrealistic, yeah. Okay. I've got the short straw again. Yeah. Um, I'm Damien from Oxted in Surrey, which is about uh, halfway between London and Brighton. Um, we decided there's probably two approaches to this. One is to, um, to go in and say, these are our figures, your figure is unrealistic, it doesn't work, um, accept our figures or nothing. And we didn't really think that was going to work. We thought the better way to, um, to approach it was to say to, to, to try and get the seller on board by saying, look, if anyone's going to get you to your price, it's going to be us. Let's see how we can do it. And it's then to find out um, how the price was arrived at. Was it the vendor's price? Was it the agent's price? How do they actually calculate that price? And then once you start to uh, have that discussion, it's about building the rapport, um, understanding what's going through the seller's mind, what they're actually looking for. And we go through the questions uh, like, um, this is what you want, but what do you actually need? And try to break down what the requirements are um, over a period of time. And then when, when, we, when we've built rapport and we've got the confidence of the seller, we can share our figures with them and uh, get them to see it from our point of view, and then see if there's any maybe upside in the deal. If the deal turns out better than our figures um, suggest, well, then maybe there's up, upside at the end of the deal for the seller. Um, so that's as far as we got from, from my notes, blank page. Anything else I've missed, chaps? Chap what, so basically, how, how we overcome the deal. Do you want to grab the mic just oh, for the uh, recording? Hi, I'm Dave from, Ram, uh, from Ramsgate. Um, so how did we overcome? So what we usually face a lot of is the agents have been in there beforehand and they've just set these figures that are just mm. unrealistic. 
So then what we try and do is um, we try and get them committed based on, because they know we're kind of developers. So I think they kind of use that in their favor. Um, so then we try and get them on board to work with us and it's based on units and what we can do with it. Um, so it is, a, it is a difficult one and we're facing this on two deals as we speak now. Um, but it, it can work if you've got good planners what we can do, but we kind of bring them in with us so they can see what struggles we've got to get to their number, opposed to getting into that like buying a second hand car deal kind, kind of thing. It is a difficult one and it does take the expertise of all, all of you and us to all work together as well. Mm. You know. Yeah, it, it's a really good point because, you know, very often, as you write, agents have given a, a, a wrong idea. And the thing that Damien mentioned, you know, going in, if someone says, you know, well, you could turn this into five flats and it will be worth this amount, um, we can often use what's called an overage. So we say, well, okay, we think it's worth this. And, and we'll agree to buy, buy this, but if you're right and we actually sell for this, we'll give you some extra money. And, and the whole point is if they're over-optimistic and they think it's worth far more than it's ever going to be, well, actually, we can afford, if we get the price we want, we can say, well, we'll give you a significant amount of that extra amount because it's probably never going to happen because they're being over-optimistic. But they think, this is amazing, we're getting a significant amount of extra money if we are actually right. And so it's a it's a way of finding really good balance, I think. Rob, yeah. anything to add to that? Or, sorry, Dave. Well, the other thing is, um, as well, because you know when, when you're there, you know they're speaking to other people. Yeah. So let's say they, they give this unrealistic figure, opposed to saying, oh, that's far too much. I say, OK, let's see what we can do. Um, but you've got to work with us. Hmm. So on the basis of getting you into a lockout agreement, if we can get this amount through planning, I can give you that figure. Yeah. But this also works in like the other way. If we only get this amount, are you open to come down? Now, what he's, all, what he's done there is he's signed a bit of paper with me, us. So we will, uh, like, initially get somewhere, but just work with his figure to begin with, where you know that figure will come down, opposed to, I hate a negotiation. Because yeah. I think with negotiation, they'll always leave their options open, if that makes sense. Yeah, it kind of depends. I, I think, um, again, it comes back to all finding what's really important for them. Yeah, it's usually the cost, isn't it? Like, it's the price. Usually. Uh, be very careful of that assumption. Yeah. Be very careful of that assumption. Often it is, but not always. Mm. Yeah. Rob, anything to add to that? No, we'll just see if the other tables come up with anything else and then yeah. we'll sorry, finish the right. Oh, sorry. sorry. Hello, Ted from uh, Kent. Um, Hi, Ted. Ted. Hello. Uh, one thing that I came up against this situation as well, um, and using some specialist knowledge, because I am an accountant, was actually to say, well, you know, you might be asking for an unrealistic price, but the price I pay you, the headline price I pay you, is not what you're going to end up with in your bank account. You've got to take tax and cost and everything else into consideration. So I actually suggested perhaps let's make this deal take a bit longer and think about structuring or incorporation or something like that, that actually will end up with more in your bank account when there's less tax to pay. And you know, we've, we've gone down that route, we've taken a bit of time down that route, she's taking advice from her accountant, etc. So it comes back to saying, well, what is it that they want? For her it was to get as much money as she could, net, not gross, because yeah. what she's selling yeah. it for doesn't really matter. It's what she ends up with that she can go and buy her house down in, on the coast or wherever she was gonna go. So it's just to think about, well, can we take a bit longer change it around a bit and, and, and look at it from a different angle. Yeah. Great, great tip. Let's have a round of applause this table and on to the next one. Uh, hello, everybody. It's Christina here from Essex. Hi, and, um, hi. Um, on our table, we did discuss pretty much the same sorts of things as um, the other table. I think the other things to add were that um, Identify if there are time scales that this particular vendor is working within because that can sometimes help to um, help them to see their unrealistic expectations won't fit within those time scales. I think the other thing that we were talking about was do they need the cash or actually are they looking for something slightly different and would they be prepared to work with a different arrangement because if you can move people from or understand more about exactly why they need that particularly high unrealistic price, 
you might be able to find a way of getting the win-win for both parties. You might be able to find the way that, yes, it's an unrealistic expectation, but if they don't need it all straight away and if they're prepared to work in a different way, they could ultimately get it. So the overage option that you were talking about or other options that would deliver that valuation at a later time. Um, and then I think we also have, have they got a personal attachment? Is there a reason why they want that unrealistic value? And it, it is about the rapport, it is trying to just get to the bottom of what is it that is really holding that price in their mind. And you've got to be true to yourself about what you can afford. And we have had this experience where eventually we had to say, look, it just doesn't work for us. You know, your price is too high in the way that you want to do it. Why don't you go out and explore other options and if it doesn't work for you, come back to us because we'll be here and we'll be ready to talk at that time. And then I think, I, don't, I didn't catch your name, but yeah, Sebastian also had this situation where he held firm and he knew what his price was and the other chap had a much, much higher price, but through rapport, through education and through a dialogue, they eventually met in the middle. So it really does depend on... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we, we didn't actually meet, meet in the middle. It was um, Chris Moss's book, Never Split the Difference. So the, the, the vendor had a value. I had a, my own private valuation. Um, and I held firm, they held firm, and it carried on. And every time I'd just throw it back at them, well, I've got this valuation, well, you've got that valuation. And we kept it going. And then um, by the end, I, I gave in a very a small fraction to make it feel like I'd moved. And that was enough just to get it over the line. Yeah. Great. So I guess touching. Hi, I'm Sam from Cambridge as well. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. So I guess touching on this table said you can also take all these concepts and flip it to also the investing side. So we're using a, an investor for our church project, and they actually come back to us and said, "Look, we'll actually uh, lend you the money, but for a percent less." because they knew the area that the GDV was going to be higher than what we set it for, and we were really conservative with it, that uh, they said, but we'd like some of the uplift if you get above this price. So it's just about listening to what they say. Mm. And obviously, we were absolutely happy with that, and they want to be more on board of us. And they know then as well, because the area, they know the area so well, that they um, think it's a great project. So you can flip these concepts around. That's a great tip. Thanks, Sam. Round of applause at that time as well. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, challenge number four. So, uh, third paragraph, based on the owner's circumstances, you believe a great solution would be a purchase option. Uh, they're a bit of a dinosaur, so you want to explain this in a way that meets their needs and satisfies the selling agent. So, we're faced with it. Ah, yeah. We're faced with it. We're basically, um, how do you explain it in simple terms? So, table, two tables at the back. Okay. Shall I yeah. go first? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Brett, Oxygen Projects, Nottingham. Hello, Brett. Hi, Brett. Brett. Hello. <laughs> yeah, so we've got um, the uh, dilemma up on the screen there. Made some assumptions that the fact finders has ruled out a preference would be a quick sale. So we're, we're at a situation where we're trying to get the most for the vendor. And with that, there would have been a conversation along the lines of, if you'd like us to buy it now, we can make an offer, but it's going to be X. Um, in the way that you said, don't, don't expect that to be favourable. But what we could look at is perhaps working together. What I wouldn't be doing is using the terms purchase option straight away. I'd keep away from anything too technical, anything that might spook them. Yeah. Talk about the benefits and the process. Um, and I'd say that if we work together, share the risks to get a common benefit, a common upside, shared upside. So if we could work together for a period of time and try and keep that... Certainly in initial conversations when they ask us about what period that would be, as short as possible, but over the course of negotiations, perhaps extend that out if we need to. Um, explain that we will be taking some risks because we would um, be paying possibly legal fees, any planning fees, architect's fees, drawings, this kind of thing. But what we'd like to do to be able to work together would have some exclusivity, to have a period of security for ourselves, to make sure our efforts didn't sort of go to, to waste. Um, we could possibly offer to pay his uh, fees, solicitor's fees. Um, there's a couple of assumptions or a couple of, uh, again, circumstances that might be different. Um, is the property empty? Is it a commercial property that's empty, but does he have a mortgage on it? So the longer we've got a purchase option, he might have bills building up uh, month, on, month in, month out. So we'd have to discuss that as well, and if so, would we consider paying those bills? 
Um, if it is tenanted and it's drawing income, we'd arrange for him to re be in receipt. You've got a purchase option, so we don't own it at that point, so we'd continue um, receiving any income. Um, and I, th I think that's it, really. If there's anything else to, to add to it, but that would be my way to go. So coming together of a collective, a greater good, really, um, built on rapport, um, and with that, trying to, you know, I'll say, call the shots a little bit. I'd also be using credibility as well and saying, like, you know, this is something that we've done quite a lot of. I have our website. You can go onto our website and see what we've done in the background. Because if it's unfamiliar to them, or it's familiar to us, just let them know that we've done it many times. They're in safe hands. So maybe websites and things go a long way to, to building that kind of rapport or, or sense of security. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. There's, a, there's the, the last part, obviously, have we done anything like that? We have done lease options um, quite a number over the years, actually. But a very recent one was a block of seven apartments that we got a lease option on. Um, it, we actually paid market value for the block. Uh, it was tenanted with AST tenants. Um, we've got a five-year option on it, and we're taking a long lease on it. We're a care provider. We're property developers, but we're care providers as well. Uh, so our care company uh, with the Housing Association is taking a long lease on it. That in itself will add to the overall value above bricks and mortar. So they didn't know that. They were a property company. Um, they were receiving, it was fully let on ASTs. So we've matched um, the income level on a five-year lease. So actually it'll net out better for them because they've got no voids, management, et cetera. Um, and um, we'll, we'll get the lease on, we'll give them their asking price at the time. Uh, over a five-year period. So, again, it's circumstances. Like I say, that was a property company, not a dinosaur. They actually knew the property world, but they didn't necessarily know the lease world or the, the supported living world. So that's a bit of an example of ours. Um, yeah, anything to add on our table? <coughs> so we'll go to the final table. I've got two little comments there. Yep. One is, you're absolutely right, we'll never mention the word lease option or purchase option. That's always... The terminology we use to know what we're talking about, but we'd never ever say that to uh, a, a seller. However, as Ryan Jaren will, I'm sure, um, testify to this, actually in the commercial world, people do get options and vendor finance, these kind of things, because that's where these concepts have actually come from. So without using to when you start to describe it, they, they might some, sometimes say, oh, you mean purchase option, which are. Oh, Thank God they know what it is. But just be careful. They might think they know what it is. Their definition or understanding what it is might be different from yours. So again, just be careful not to make any assumptions if they do actually say that. Anything from you, Rob, on that? No, I agree. No, no thank okay. you. Great. That's, That's it. For the right table over there. Thank you yep. very much. I'm Richie from Winchester in Hampshire. Hi, Richie. Richie. It's like an AA meeting, isn't it? This is brilliant. <laughs> Hi, Richie. <laughs> I think it's important that we actually listened to what Simon and Rob were saying, and I don't think the rest of you did. So what, how would we approach this? <laughs> We'd lean in. <laughs> We'd smile. <laughs> We'd nod. And I'd ask you if you'd been to the International Jazz Conference in Africa <laughs> <laughs> and ridden any elephants. And guess what I'd do then? I'd wait six seconds. <laughs> so you need to listen. That's what it's about. What would we do? I got stitched up here by this table. Look, advisory board members, they went, you, you stand up. So I'm a bit nervous about speaking, as you'll find out after lunch. How would we approach it? Well, forget all that stuff there. We'd actually re-establish rapport. We're assuming we've got rapport, but I'm a great believer you've got to re-establish that rapport every time. Yeah. So if you're going to go back in, and it is the Afri African elephants or whatever, just go back in and say, oh, how did it go? Was that trip good? Or how did your son get on at this or get on with that? So re-establish rapport. Unless you re-establish it every time, you don't get anywhere. Then the challenge for us was just to clarify what they were looking for. Because we've had several other meetings. So just, just clarify, what was it you were looking for? And if you can't get to that number, okay, then you might be saying in terms of what would your wording explanation be, I might have something for you, I might. I might have something with, for you which might be of interest, which could be a win-win, it could work for us. If I had something that could get you closer to where you want to be, would that be of interest to you? So we just clarify where they're interested. And if they are interested, then we can start to explain. And absolutely, we probably wouldn't explain it was a purchase option unless they knew what it was. But we might explain it in terms of, let me explain how we've done this for other people in the past, mm. how this has come off, and how they have achieved out of this. So that's our approach to it. 
In terms of we'd done it, well, we had a bit of an argument on the table. We had a difference of opinion, but actually we concluded that Susie was wrong and she accepted that gracefully and disappeared <laughs> off out of the room. <laughs> no, no. What we were talking about was actually uh, building the rapport with um, the, probably the strongest person, but a great belief in building the rapport with the agent. Because we said we've got an agent involved here. Do not cut the agent out. Even if you think it's worth a few quid, do not. Okay, and my belief was actually it's a, it's a great thing to build that rapport with the agent first because who did the vendor go to first? They went to the agent. That's their trusted partner. Perhaps sometimes, though, as Susie quite rightly pointed out, sometimes they're fed up with that agent, so you have to build it with them. And I think the conclusion was build it with the strongest person, but definitely do yeah. not cut the agent out. Yeah, great advice. In fact, we, we want to keep the rapport with the agent because... Once we've done this deal, we go straight back to the agent and say, right, when's the next one? Um, if we've done what we said we're going to do, we've jumped straight to the top of their credibility list. So I absolutely completely agree on that. Unless, of course, the agent's a complete idiot and getting in the way, in which case we might go just go direct to the seller. But generally, we, we do want to keep the agent there. We want to make sure the agent gets paid. Do you want to? Yeah. Just, uh, chip in a couple of points, um, which are specific to the commercial space with this scenario, which actually put you in a better position, I believe. Mm. Um, one of the things with um, commercial agents is they tend to be a little bit more educated in real estate than residential agents. And they will actually, whereas a residential agent may be a former double glazing salesman, a commercial agent would usually know what these sort of deals are. Yeah. And the other unique aspect when you're dealing with an agent is often outside the property, they invite you to pitch them with these sort of deals. Yeah. Because unlike residential property, where you see for sale and two let boards, with commercial property, you see the V board, and on one side it has for sale, and on the other side it says to lease. Yeah. You see boards that say all inquiries. That is basically saying, pitch up the phone, pick up the phone and pitch us. They're inviting you um, to come up with something creative. And that's something that's quite unique. And the other the second point I just wanted to mention is that although I'd never used the language lease option when you're talking with a vendor, you explain it in simple English, but you tend to find that commercial property owners tend to be business owners and are far more easier to sort of un get to understand what it is that you're explaining. And also often there's less emotional attachment because they're obviously not a homeowner, they're not living in it, so you have less of those issues to deal with. So I just wanted to say that these sort of concepts are actually easier, in my view, in commercial Completely property. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Let's thank that table. Some great comments there. Thank you. <laughs> so, Rob and I, you, we're going to have to deliberate over lunch who we think was the... Because I think they're all pretty good. And I hope yeah, you've yeah. got lots of value from other people's perspectives there. And that's what we need to remember. This, you're not on your own on this journey. You've got this network of people you can tap into. And I'd encourage you all to... You know, if you, you probably know some people here already, but I'd say when we go to lunch and in the breaks, don't just chat to the people you already know. You could chat to them anytime. Why not go and chat to people you don't know yet? Because you never know who you're speaking to. Or maybe someone's stood up and they've said something that's resonated. With. Maybe go and connect to those people because your network is your net worth. And, and remember, we're not doing this alone. It's the, it's the whole group we're connecting in. So hopefully that was useful. Rob, over to you to finish off the session. Any final words? No, no. Just thank you very much for listening. And I don't take that personally. I just, you know, assume that you were, you know, <laughs> reflecting back what was said, but yeah, thanks for that. Uh, but you actually made a very, very good point because often Simon talks about follow-up, follow-up, and often I get asked, but I don't know how to start the conversation. <sighs> I'm ringing him a month later and how do I start the conversation? So thanks for that. It was a really good learning point. Yeah. Is the reconnection is, so when you're having that conversation, think about the connection, think about the common ground because you are going to use it again and, it, you know, how exactly as Richard said, how did that go? So that's often in the follow-up. So... Thank you, but thank you very much for listening and thanks for your time. Thank, thank you. you very much, guys. Thank you.